Thank you so much. Normally, I, I know what someone's going to say about me before they introduce me, so this was a little bit of a, kind of a surprise. Um, I'm really very, very grateful. Grateful to John Cavadini for the invitation to come and grateful to all of you for being here. Uh, one of my favorite fictional characters is Lucy Pevensey. Um, do you know Lucy Pevensey from the Chronicles of Narnia? And one of the things that's often said about Lucy is that she is too happy to speak in the presence of Aslan, in the presence of, of goodness. And I do have an, a feeling of that uh, this morning. I'm, I'm really too, almost too happy to speak. Fortunately, not too, too happy to speak because that's what I'm supposed to do. Um, it's a special privilege to speak to you um, after our celebration of the Feast of the Martyrs yesterday, as will become evident as I go through the talk, um, the martyrs and the saints are very near and dear to my own heart. And almost everything that I'm gonna say, apart from some factual details about some of this, the martyrs of my own area, almost everything that I have to say has already been touched on by somebody at some point, either here or in a homily. Um, and so I'm really grateful for that because I have a sense of, you know, I'm, we're coming to the end, and I'm not, I'm not gonna say something radically different or new. I'm just gonna actually be, I think, drawing together some of the things that we've already been talking about. So, I will begin. Not long before he died, Pope St. John XXIII spoke these words confidentially. Now I understand what contribution the council requires from me. I mean, sorry, what contribution to the council the Lord requires from me, my suffering. These are incredibly moving and inspiring words. Uh, in fact, made my, brought my 13-year-old to tears recently on the feast of St. John the 23rd. Um, incredibly moving and inspiring and also very mysterious. How is it that, that suffering from a disease apparently unrelated to the work of the council can contribute to the work of the church? Put another way, I suppose, this paper explores what it is that we're offering the church when we offer it up. This morning, I want to explore this mystery through two images of suffering in the life of the church. Framing this exploration is a description of the church as the body of Christ that comes from the work of Eve Congar. The first image of suffering is that of the martyrs of the English Reformation. Incidentally, one of those martyrs was celebrated yesterday in, back in England, would have been um, the, the feast day of St. Philip Howard. Um, <clears throat> Much of what I have to say about the martyrs has been set up nicely by that celebration that we had yesterday, and especially by Bishop Rhodes' homily. The second image, which I come to by way of Mark's gospel, is the image that L'Arche reflects. By contemplating these images, I hope that we will come to appreciate more deeply the hidden gifts that the Spirit gives us, even when those gifts involve suffering, and that we will be convinced that people who seem to bring to the body of Christ only their need in fact, bring a gift as holy as the martyr sacrifice. So to begin. To begin, I present to you the image of the church. In the mystery of the church, Congar offers this meditation on the ordinary faithful, and I, I quote him here at some length. At Pentecost, he writes, it was not the apostles alone who received the Holy Ghost, but all the believers then existing, and as the Acts says, assembled in the upper room to the number about 120. All of them were animated and made active by the coming of the Spirit. All of them. All of them were made active. He's very clear on that. You, too, are one of the cells of the body. Do not say or think you have nothing to do in its regard, for you are to aid in its building. Your spiritual health, your vitality in Christ, are necessary for the body's wholeness, to the realization of God's plan, and to the full health and vitality of all other Christians. No doubt, if a body receives some superficial wound that is less serious than the loss of a hand or an eye, but still, it is not to be ignored. And what do you know of the place destined for you by Christ in the body or in the history of salvation? Think, for instance, of Therese of Lisieux or Charles de Foucault. Reckon the immensity of their spiritual influence, and you will realize that the body of Christ is built up, that sacred history is accomplished by the means of the most hidden gifts distributed by the Spirit as he wills, in secret. Indeed, as much to a solitary in the Sahara or a young nun in an unknown convent as to the pontiffs who rule the church. Once again, the reality which is the church needs to be seen with the eye of faith. St. Paul likens the church to a letter from Christ, and it is by the gifts, often quite hidden, poured out by the Spirit of Pentecost that this letter comes to be written." End quote. 
I'd like to assume that this vision of the church is immediately and obviously appealing. It appeals particularly to me, however, because it makes central the Spirit's work in every believer in building up the body of Christ. Every believer. The reason this is so significant will unfold in the course of the paper, but I could admit now that it is at least twofold. In the first place, I'm unsure of myself. I look at what I have done, and I can't really see how it contributes to sacred history. I think I haven't done enough. I haven't done a big thing. This passage reminds me that it isn't just the eye or ear that matters in the body. I'm sure I'm not those, but each and every cell. Without any pretensions to grandeur, I'm happy to think of myself as a cell. In the second place, there are people in the church whose presence I consider absolutely indispensable, but whose purpose in the body is not immediately obvious. In this, my thinking has been trained by my experience as a mother, especially as a mother of a child with Down syndrome. So I see children as one example. We all value them. We appreciate what Jesus says about them in the Gospels, and we welcome them. But it isn't always clear what they contribute now as young children. Another example, and the one I'll be considering at length in the paper, is the ambiguous role of those with intellectual disabilities and other kinds of cognitive impairments, including dementia. I have argued elsewhere in that book <laughs> that being a Christian consists to a very large degree in having one's imagination and desires shaped by faith in Christ. To follow Christ and live in the hope of his promise is to see the world in his light and to hold that light and hope out to others. My description of Christian identity does not emphasize intellectual assent, but the shape of our imagination and desires. I want to make certain that we do not conceive of the faith we hold and practice as excluding those who cannot comprehend or recall it. But how does the person who seems to offer only his or her need hold out the light of Christ to others without this capacity? The short answer is, of course, that the Holy Spirit shines it through us and builds up the body of Christ in and through us. In order to give a fuller answer, I turn to these other two images of suffering, situations of suffering and need. In such situations, it's unclear how the body of Christ could possibly benefit from our predicament or from that of those near to us. I suggest that in th these situations of human need, we see another dimension of what it is to be church, a dimension that's true of Congar's vision. The two instances are very different from one another. The first is drawn from my experience of living in a place with nearly 1,500 years of Christian history. The particular period of that history that features in this paper is short, about 150 years of intense persecution of the Church of Catholics during the English Reformation. The suffering experienced by Catholics during that time is both heartbreaking and inspiring. The second is drawn from my experience as a theologian who is also the mother of a child with Down syndrome. Thinking about the practice of Christianity and the nature of the church is my job. Yet it is in no way isolated from my intention to raise my daughter as a Christian in the Catholic Church. At the intersection of my theological and parental concerns, I found Jean Vanier and L'Arche International. Vanier and the community he founded have taught me a great deal about the place of suffering and need within the church. As we read these chapters of the letter from Christ together, we are reminded that the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. As we walk with them, we too draw near to God. First then, I propose to move off the page and into a particular landscape, a landscape that is suffused, at least to my eyes, with the light of grace. It's colored by the witness of the martyrs of the English Reformation. The particularity of my eyes is important for two reasons. First, my eyes are those trained by the church's teaching on Christ and the saints. Second, my eyes are not native to the landscape I now inhabit. That landscape has reinvigorated my imagination, to pick up on uh, Sean's word yesterday, my imagination of, the church, imagination of the church, and has strengthened my commitment. But martyrs should not have been a new idea for me. Uh, the parish in my hometown, in fact, is American martyrs, the very ones we celebrated yesterday. But when I moved to England, my imagination was opened up to the witness of the martyrs of the Reformation. Their deaths bear witness to the one body of Christ, enlivened by the Spirit. The offering, the offering they make, not only in their dying, but in living for the church in a dangerous time, is made up of hidden gifts. But it's necessary uh, first to mention where I come from. Um, <laughs> I come from somewhere that's not a place, Tim. It's really not a place. Um, I come from, it's beautiful, but it's not a place. Uh, I come from Manhattan Beach, California, which is named for the town 
in New York. It's not named for somewhere in Europe, it's named for somewhere else in the United States. Um, and the striking fe feature of the landscape for me is its historical barrenness. The oldest remaining house in town, that little, little red house there, was moved to a park in 1987. And it now houses what I think residents proudly think of as the Manhattan Beach Historical Society for all 100 years of its history. The house was built around 1905. This is where I come from. This is where I live now. This is Durham, England. Durham, as with most places in the UK, has a long history of saints and their struggle for holiness. The cathedral in the top right, your right, my left, yeah, in the top right, was founded in 1093, right? The castle was begun in 1072, probably on the site of an even older Anglo-Saxon fortress. And these two buildings give their city, the cityscape its unique character. This is a place. Um, but they also preserve some of the Catholic history of the place. Benedictine monks built the cathedral to house the remains of St. Cuthbert, a seventh century monk whose exemplary life and deeds are recorded by St. Bede. One of the oldest remaining parts of the castle is the Norman Chapel, which is there in the center, in the crypt, which was built probably about 1078. And I was there, happily, for the very first Catholic mass celebrated in that Norman Chapel since the Reformation. Um, it's a place that holds on to its very long history. And the ordinary buildings occupy historic sites as well. Um, the lower, my left, your right corner, is a house on Dryburn Hill, which is my address. It's where I live. It looks like basically an ordinary house. And an older man from our neighborhood had come to deliver a package to us that had been t brought to his house by mistake. And um, he told me, as he was standing there on my doorstep, having to give me this package, he said, you know, the martyrs died here, Dryburn Hill. This is where the martyrs died. And I thought, how fascinating, you know? I live in a place where martyrs actually died. Um, so I, I look, you know, looked up a few things. The, the lower building there is actually a building at my son's school. Um, and it's, it was the actual site, the real place where the gallows were. Um, and it's named the Martyrs Building. Okay, so the, the history of the church um, before and during the Reformation is, is all around us. I can't walk through my town without being reminded of the martyrs and their sacrifice. Um, and as I said before, this is a place with a long, long history and a deep memory of that history. So to give you a sense of both the history and the way that we remember it, um, I just need to mention St. Godric. Uh, there he is, in the lower corner there, that's St. Godric. And the building that you see in the center is Finkel Priory, which was founded on the site of his hermitage and grew up around where he, where he lived, uh, mostly after he died. Um, of course, during the dissolution of the monasteries, it was destroyed, um, and now it's a ruin. It is, like most places, an English heritage site. So tourists come and walk through it and think about our glorious history that no one, that no one really thinks about the monks anymore, but they really like the fact that we have these old buildings with ruins. Um, in the bottom right-hand corner, though, what you see is the back of Father Colm, who's the chaplain at my children's primary school, and the photo is taken at an event that happened on the Feast of St. Bede in 2015, where the children at St. Godric's made a pilgrimage to Finco, and the first mass at Finco was said, since the Reformation, more than 500 years. Um, so it's a, it's a beautiful landscape with a long history, um, and it, it really just draws in that reflection on the martyrs and what they've offered. So here are a few of the martyrs. Um, the martyrs of England and Wales remain committed to the church in an increasingly hostile environment. And part of the fascinating thing about them is that people continue to be converted they continue to return to the faith. Priests, you know, people, men went abroad to train, to come back, to serve, knowing that they would die. Um, I think it's uh, it just, it, I can't describe to you how much this has moved me as I've lived there. Um, we can't tease out the link between their suffering and the building up of the body of Christ, I don't think. It's a mystery, right? Ultimately, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. But I think getting to know them a little bit better and allowing them to inhabit our imaginations can give us a slightly different angle on that mystery. The Durham martyrs and all the martyrs of England and Wales, they were ex executed between 1535 and 1679, so our American martyrs died during that same period. They offer two rich resources for the Catholic imagination, their witness and their stories. 
The narratives are rich and fascinating. When I was running a weekly homeschool lesson with the really creative title of Saint of the Week, uh, for two 10-year-old boys, these saints featured almost any time I could have an excuse. You know, they came up in the calendar, sort of in the general vicinity, and we would, we would talk about them. As Archbishop Vigneron mentioned yesterday, martyrs play well with boys of a certain age. Um, so we learned together what it actually means to be hung, drawn, and quartered. We read about clandestine masses, and especially enjoyed finding about, but, out about priest holes and St. Nicholas Owen, who was a master joiner who's credited with having constructed perhaps hundreds of such holes during the Reformation. Of course, the boys were captivated by intrigue rather than piety. One reason for studying some of the martyrs of the English Ref Reformation with the boys was that during that period, being a Roman Catholic was an extreme sport involving these clandestine masses, subterfuge, and ultimate risk. It was anything but boring. Sparking their admiration for these men and women who gave their lives for the church was some of the most rewarding teaching that I have done. Unfortunately, I only ran the lessons for a year, so we missed out on many remarkable narratives. I want to share just a handful of these with you to help you to see the wide range of people who gave their lives for the Catholic faith during the Reformation. Our famous, most famous local martyr, St. John Bost, was drawn, hung, drawn, and quartered on the hill where I live in 1594. The actual site of his martyrdom was the martyr's building at St. Leonard's School. Um, one of the houses of that school, which is my son's school, is named for St. John Bost. And yes, there are four houses at that school, just like at Hogwarts. It's, it's a thing in uh, um, English secondary schools. Our another northern martyr, St. Margaret Clitheroe, was executed in Yorkshire, which is about an hour south of Durham in 1586. She was a convert to Catholicism. When she was tried, she struck a balance between her commitment to the faith and her concern for her children. If she testified and, and you know, claimed her Catholicism, her children then would have been subjected to torture and trial themselves. Uh, but she said nothing. And so instead of being hung, she was cr crushed to death by a heavy stone, um, which is why there are stones along the bottom of the, of the picture of her there in the corner. Two martyrs from slightly further afield complete the picture I'm sketching. The first, St. John Plessington, was a priest executed in 1579. On the gallows, he told the crowd in this amazing speech that was then printed and distributed um, that he would rather die than doubt anything taught by, quote, our holy mother, the Roman Catholic Church, end quote. The other, Blessed Humphrey Pritchard, was an Oxford barman. He was martyred with two priests and another layman in July 1589. The brief narrative of his last moments, I think, merits our attention. I quote, at the top of the ladder, he told the crowd that he died, quote, for being a Catholic and faithful Christian of Holy Church, end quote. A Puritan minister mocked him for being ignorant. Pritchard replied that, quote, what I cannot explain by my mouth, I am ready and prepared to explain and testify to you at the cost of my blood, end quote, whereupon he was thrown from the ladder. Blessed Humphrey's words, last words are as eloquent in their own way as St. John Plessington's, and they emphasize the, the differences in their education and social status. Nevertheless, these two men shared a common cause. They died for the church. That is their witness. But the thing that strikes me the most, I think, about the martyrs is that they, they died very much for the church. Um, and every time I'm tempted to think, well, maybe it doesn't matter, so it matters. It matters so much that they were willing to die for it. That's all I really need to know. Um, now, all over the world and throughout the history of the church, people have died for the faith. But in England, this landscape is suffused with the faith and courage of those who died for the church. The church, which is so marginalized in British society, which people just don't care about. Uh, it's the same church for which St. Margaret and Blessed Humphrey and the rest gave their lives. If we can see nothing else through their collective witness, we ought to see this, that the church is worth dying for. Moreover, because their stories and their lives are local, and the churches and schools and roads and rooms and houses are named for them, the church that they died for is not just the church universal, which it obviously is, but it's, it's our church. It's our own parish. It's our deanery. It's where we go to church. Um, they died so that we could go to mass, and there's a very strong connection there. For those like Blessed Humphrey and St. Margaret, the experience of belonging to the church mattered far more uh, than the abstract concept of her being one holy Catholic and apostolic. What we do in the everyday life of our parishes matters. 
We, like the martyrs, ourselves. Plain and simple, perhaps, but our bit, as we might call it in Britain, matters. It may not seem so at the time. We may not be able to foresee how our small sacrifices contribute to the church and future generations. But the stories of the martyrs remind us that the work is the Holy Spirit's and not our own to direct. The next part is called Reading the Letter from Christ. The martyrs' courage is certainly to be admired, but how is it that their suffering resembles the everyday suffering in our own experience? How is it to be compared with the suffering of those who are ill, like uh, St. John the 23rd, or disabled, like the core members of large communities? Seeing the resemblance requires some help from scripture and also from Graham Greene. Uh, there is another dimension, I think, to martyrdom that shows a point of similarity between the suffering of the martyrs and those who suffer in ways that seem wholly unconnected to their faith. A look behind the scenes in the life of the martyrs will not only help us to embrace the cross in our own lives, though it does do that, it also suggests that the things we consider the big sacrifices might not be those that contribute the most to the upbuilding of the body of Christ. We'll move a step further in our investigation of St. John the 23rds inspiring and mysterious saying. So most of the time, our practice of faith doesn't bear much resemblance to the high drama of Catholic practice during the Reformation. But perhaps that is in part because we misconstrue that drama. We have the text of some impressive speeches from the gallows, but that isn't the way the witness is generally voiced. St. John Bost recited the Ang Angelus as he ascended the ladder. But his limbs were hung on the castle walls and his head displayed on a pole on Framelgate Bridge, one of the main pedestrian bridges over the River Weir in Durham. Many would have heard him pr his prayer as he went to his death. Many more saw how his displayed body voiced his suffering. This chapter in the letter from Christ is written in the language of suffering. The martyr sufferings were participation in the sufferings of Christ so also they share in the weakness and vulnerability of Christ on the cross, as John put it last night. This indicates, I think, a parallel between those who are poor in spirit and those who suffer courageously for their faith. The parallel could be seen in Matthew chapter 5, and I'm going to read you a chunk of verses there. Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There are the martyrs at the end those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, parallel with all unlikely predicates, those who are poor in spirit. Now, I, I might be able to see meekness in the martyrs at a stretch, but poverty of spirit is much more difficult. To me, the martyrs exude hope and courage, not poverty of spirit. So I know, and I realize in thinking about them this way, that I see the martyrs in this particular way. I'm like the boy in Graham Greene's The Power and the Glory. Because I look at them through their deaths, as he does, I only see the one side. So I reread the thoughts of the priest whom Graham, Graham Greene follows throughout the novel. Just before he's led to his death, he regrets not having tried harder to become a saint. He thinks he could have done. He believes he's failed. At once, I find myself on the other side of that window. I know that feeling, that feeling of not having done enough. I could have tried harder. The young boy who's been paying attention to all the executions doesn't see it as failure, though. All he sees is a martyr. Graham Greene's portrayal of a martyr's poverty of spirit suggests that I've missed something in my admiration of the martyrs. A handful of last words from the gallows survive, but we do not know what the martyr's last thoughts were. And I don't dare speculate, except in one case, in my capacity as mother rather than theologian. St. Margaret Clitheroe did not live to see her children grow into the men and women of God they became. And I cannot imagine going to my death without having some sorrow in my heart for them, some worry for them, some desire to put off my execution just a little while for their sakes. Maybe martyrdom is not so incompatible with poverty of spirit as I thought. And St. Margaret's death is the last sacrifice, but not the only sacrifice 
that built up the body of Christ. During her life, St. Margaret housed priests in a property bought for that purpose and equipped with priest holes. She made sure the priests were cared for and tended to the articles of the mass, laundering and mending altar cloths and vestments and taking care of the sacred vessels. Her martyrdom is dramatic, but surely the body of Christ was built up by means of all these small acts of service. Living for the church and doing the small but needful things is as much a gift as giving her life. These hidden offerings are brought to light by her martyrdom. Her, sorry, her memory was venerated and the story of her life thus remembered. But all the little things she did are also obscured in a way by her martyrdom. She's remembered as having been crushed to death by a stone and held up for this ultimate sacrifice, hiding the everyday tasks that she undertook in the service of the church. And even the witness that lived on and her surviving children. I think a lot of people don't know that um, her two sons both became priests and her daughter became a nun. Her fourth child died with her. She was pregnant at the time of her execution. So just such a poignant and heartbreaking story. Reading St. Margaret's suffering as lines in the letter of Christ leads me as a 21st century theologian to step back and reflect about the nature of the church. She bears witness with the other martyrs to two aspects of the church. First, they bear witness to the unity of the church. To be separated from Holy Mother Church was for them a fate worse than death. At the same time, they show us something about our identity as members of the body of Christ. As inspiring as each of their stories is, it is together that their lives form a chapter in the letter from Christ. Second, they bear witness to the embodiment of the practice of the faith. In their physical presence, in the celebration of the sacraments, in cherishing the articles of the Mass, and in their bodily suffering for the Church, the martyrs will not allow us to minimize the role of bodies within the body of Christ. To reduce believing in Jesus to an intellectual practice, which I think is at the heart of the spirituality that is not religious, to reduce believing in Jesus to that is to deny the significance of the body for the life of the soul. The martyrs shine a bright light on the one body that the church is, as Congar describes it. I'm, I'm going to move now into reflecting a little bit more on the hidden gifts. Giving pride of place to the image of the body of Christ not only highlights the church's unity and embodiment, but also to suggest that each member builds up the body in ways we cannot conceive. The everyday service of an Oxford bartender and a Yorkshire wife and mother contributes to sacred history. If we were to read into this that the body of Christ needs us, we wouldn't be too far wrong. And being needed, I think, is inspiration of a sort. Surely the men who left England to train as priests, intending to return and serve the persecuted church, did so because priests were needed. Right? How do you get a 12-year-old boy to show up for all the Easter triduum? You put him on the altar. You tell him that he's needed, um, and, and there he is. He might grumble, but he's there. He's attentive. And afterwards, he says, yeah, I served on Monday Thursday. Never done that before. And he was the only one, so he felt really special. He, had some, you know, he, he got something out of that that he wouldn't have gotten unless I had said to him, you're needed. They need you. Go. All right. So if, needed, if being needed in this way doesn't sound like much, think about God's repeated injunction to Israel, which is stated in Psalm 49. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will honor me. God acknowledges all the bulls and goats that the people have sacrificed, yet this is not the praise God most wants. It seems that God wants his people to know that they need him and that the glory they give to God who delivers them is the most precious praise of all. I see this dynamic at work in Mark's gospel and the narrative of Jesus healing the paralytic. So many people were gathered together to hear Jesus preaching the word that there was even a crowd around the door. So St. Mark writes, and they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, my son, your sins are forgiven. Jesus' words of absolution upset the scribes, though they only questioned Jesus in their hearts. Jesus hears anyway and responds, Why do you question thus in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your pallet, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, 
he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, take up your pallet and go home. And he rose and immediately shook up the pallet and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. I suggest that the dynamic of calling upon the Lord and being rescued and glorifying God plays out only slightly altered in this passage. The alteration consists in the way that the trouble is brought to the Lord. It is not as simple as a person, or even the house of Israel, calling upon the Lord to be saved from his or her or their own trouble. Rather, it shows how the need of one becomes an occasion for the healing of many. The paralytic's friends stand out as needed, right? They're, they're clearly needed, right? Their action sets the whole scene in motion. They seem to be the indispensable agents, apart from Jesus, of course, in the encounter. The paralytic needs them to take him to Jesus. Without their willingness to help, he would not be able to get near Jesus. From the perspective of the reader, too, the paralytic's need for healing is most evident. To Jesus, however, the paralytic looks different. He must, since Jesus' first move, is to declare that the paralytic's sins are forgiven. The friends of the paralytic don't seem at first to need anything from Jesus for themselves. They've just brought their, their friend along because he needs healing. They trust that Jesus can and will do something for, the, for their friend. That's, after all, what the passage immediately before shows us. You know, Jesus heals a leper. Jesus had healed the leper of his leprosy, after all. It seems logical to expect that he would heal this man of his paralysis. Those who lower the paralytic down through the roof call upon Jesus in a situation of trouble that isn't strictly their own. As the dynamic plays out, though, the friends act in bringing the paralytic to Jesus is equivalent to offering a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Jesus sees this trust, that is, he saw their faith, and he delivers the paralytic, revealing in the process something about his mission and hinting, at least hinting, at his divinity. The paralytic seems to offer nothing in this situation except his need for healing. Yet precisely that is what the friends need. His paralysis provides them with a reason to go to Jesus. The paralytic's need for healing because it comes an occasion for God's glory to be revealed. It appears that the paralytic only receives help from his friends and healing from Jesus, yet actually he has the most important gift to give. Now, I don't want in any way to minimize the help the friends provide. No, the paralytic's friends do for him what we ought to do for one another. They bring him to the Lord. Because he cannot walk, they carry him. I have a friend who suffered from major depression and was hospitalized. She had amnesia induced by electroshock therapy. In the midst of her illness and treatment, she could not remember the basics of her faith. Then her friends in faith held her out for her, carrying her to the Lord in prayer. This is the essential beautiful work of friendship in the body of Christ. I do want to suggest, however, that the paralytic's gift is one we need to acknowledge and value. We are all glad when we are called on to be those friends when our strength can be of use. But the cry for help? Not so much. In the world around us, nobody wants to be needy. Those who give are acclaimed, and those who need only really serve as the occasion for charity. Need itself doesn't contribute. In the church, however, we treasure the weaker members. We do so, of course, because they are made in the image of God. But I want to go a step further than that. I want to suggest that the deeply needy among us offer a constant cry for love. In their capacity, not to mention the suf their suffering, they bring a gift, the gift of voicing for us what we find so difficult to say for ourselves. Within the body of Christ, this is a hidden gift. But just as a man's paralysis takes its place in sacred history, so also we trust that the gifts of the needy, not only the disabled, but all those who need, from the unborn child to the person with advanced dementia, all the gifts of the needy build up the body of Christ. How this happens is, as I've said, a mystery. But I think we catch glimpses of it. I do think that the gift of the martyrs offers a shining example. Their suffering during the repression of the Catholic Church is, in one way, darkness. We forget because history has vindicated them, but in the midst of struggle, the restoration of the Catholic Church in England was hardly certain. Yet because history has borne them to us, their sacrifice becomes a light for us. And as I've suggested, it's not only their public executions, but also their everyday sacrifices that build up the body of Christ. Another place we catch, catch a glimpse of it in the world today is in large communities. The community gathers, the friends around the paralytic, and together they go to the Lord. And the ones who have come to give, to carry the needy, find that they themselves are the ones who receive.
I think there's a striking parallel here to the language of accompaniment that we keep hearing and also to the priest penitent dynamic that we were talking about yesterday. The one who comes alongside uh, benefits as well, receives from the Lord as well. Not only that, but large communities shine like the martyrs of England and Wales, the darkness of suffering and tragedy being transformed into a light for others. Developmental disability in itself is tragic, though as the mother of a 15-year-old with Down syndrome, I tend not to see it in that way most of the time, because I just see Anna. She's my daughter. But the world outside sees the girls with Down syndrome and whose speech is difficult to understand. Although physical suffering often comes along with that 47th chromosome, the true tragedy is in the way Down syndrome in particular and developmental disabilities in general are construed. Jean Vanier rejected just this construal when he invited two men to leave the institution and come to live with him. Larch takes the notion that disability creates a vacuum that only strength can fill and turns it on its head. The tragic and painful ap ap sorry, aspects of living with a disability are woven into the life of the community, bearing one another's burdens and sharing one another's joys. Yes, joys. The communities that bear suffering and tragedy in their hearts are not somber places. On the contrary, what one experiences in large is a joy. This is especially true at La Ferme, the retreat center in Trolley, where large began. Jean Vanier lives there and still gives retreat, though he's growing, retreats, though he's growing frail. He's fond of repeating what one of the core members of the community says about him. And I quote, when I came to large, Jean Vanier looked after me. Now I look after him. End quote. Vanier laughs. He's like every other assistant who begins by caring and ends in joy. In large, suffering and the shadow of death are constant, and yet the setting is unmistakably that of green pastures and a cup running over, of goodness and mercy abiding in the community. The darkness of disability and the attendant rejection and suffering are not obliterated, but mysteriously drawn into the light of grace. Vanier be began from the basic premise that the cry for love is a gift though he doesn't describe it in quite that way. Raphael and Philippe, the two men Vanier chose to join him at Trolley in 1964, had something to offer, though the world could not see it in that way. Yet, just like the paralytic, they had the most important gift to give. We celebrate Jean Vanier's work with good reason, but we ought to remember that he is like the friends of the paralytic. Vanier's own life was not marked by need. He himself voiced no cry for help. His only desire was to be near Jesus. Raphael and Philippe gave him the opportunity to do just that, to draw near to Jesus. We see the international movement of L'Arche International 50 years on and are amazed. We glorify God and say, we never saw anything like this. We never would have seen the miracle of L'Arche without the dynamic that the paralytic and his friends illustrate for us. That the one who seems to have only need is just the one we need to bring us closer to Jesus. I could stop there, but I want to say just one thing, because I've said, you know, living as the body of Christ in the secular age. And the thing that I want to leave you with is this. Um, I have a good friend who's an atheist. Uh, she and I are mostly friends online on Facebook. And one of the things that we reflect on together is the suffering in the world and how mysterious it is. Um, but it's always a mystery. It's a mystery for her as much as it is for me. And what I have that distinguishes me from her is not, as we, someone said yesterday, not moral vision. Um, I think of her as quite a moral person, an ethical person, an adm admirable person, though she's an atheist. No, the difference is that she has mystery, and I have mystery with redemption. I have a belief that uh, God or wisdom arranges all things delightfully, and that that arrangement will be revealed at the end of time. Uh, Bishop Flora said earlier, our end game has to be hope. I think that's what distinguishes the body of Christ in a secular age. Our end game is hope. Thank you.